It's Home Assistant release 2022.11. Let's get into the details. So I'm going to quickly cover what's in 2022.11. Home Assistant team didn't have a, a release party this month because they're focusing on state of the open home and getting ready for that. So let's talk about what's in uh, this release. Uh, a lot of it was based on suggestions from month of what the heck. And month of what the heck was a way for you to go in through uh, their social media and whatnot and talk to them about what options and things you think should be added to Home Assistant, what things you think should be improved and all of that. So they took a lot of the su suggestions and have started to work on those. Not everything's going to be in this release, but some of them are in this release. And of course, we'll talk about that here in a minute. All right, so let's get right into it. Tile card. This is the new dashboard uh, card called the tile card. It's a quick overview of an entity. The icon can be tapped to toggle the entity, such as a light switch or whatnot, and the rest of the card, clicking that brings up the more info. So if we look at that right here, you can see that I have a few of those built out right now. These are all tile cards right here. If you click on the actual icon, it does the action. So toggling on and off lights or whatnot. If you click on just the icon itself, it brings up the more information window. And so it's, an, it's a new way to um, look at things or build dashboards uh, in Home Assistant. And this is the first iteration. It's one of the first cards added to this release. It's gonna bring a new style of card and whatnot to Home Assistant. So with that, you'll probably see more dashboard videos from me as they continue to add things. So if you wanna know more about what's coming up in Home Assistant, join everyone for the State of the Open Home live stream. Um, and that will be linked down below. You can also search for it on the Home Assistant uh, channel in YouTube. All right, so statistics card. There's already a statistics graph card. Try to say that three times fast, which can be used to display graphs of long-term st uh, statistics of an entity. But what if you wanna just display a single number based on the long-term history of something? Well, you can do that now with a statistics card. And I've got two of them built right here. This is my outdoor temperature for a month. This is the mean temperature over that period of time. So for the last month, it's been about 67 degrees overall. And for the last week, for humidity, it's been about 80%. And if we wanna add one of these, I'll just show you real quick. If you go in here and add a statistics card, we'll search for statistics card. You'll choose an entity here and we'll do a temperature We'll find one, attic temperature will be, how about that one right there, temperature. And you've got a choice of mean, min, max for these different uh, entities right here. You don't have a change entity on this one, but mean, min, and act, max, you can choose that. And you can choose the period, today, yesterday, last week, this week, last year. So you could actually do comparisons of different entities if you wanna see what it was last year compared to this year. You could set up two different cards and look at them that way. Then you can change the name, the icon, the unit that's displayed, and then the theme uh, is optional. And then we would just save it. And now we have a temperature sensor for the last, um, I don't even know what I chose on that one. Let's see what we chose on that one. So for the last uh, month, the average temperature or mean temperature rather in the attic has been 76 degrees. So that's how easy it is to use the statistics card. It gives you a single, uh, number for whatever range of time you look at for that entity. All right, that one's nice to play with. This is a really cool thing. Uh, if you ever play with automations and you're doing a lot of automation work, especially automations that have timers and things in those, if you redo an automation, add an automation, edit an automation, and then you reload the automations, that causes all of your automations to reload. And that's reset, resets timers, resets states, stuff that just could mess up your automations when they're running. So what they've come up with now is the ability to reload just the automation and the script for that matter that has been edited, added, whatever. And this is one of those that ended up in the what the heck month with 180 plus votes. So it was a pretty heavy um, or a pretty highly upvoted topic. And so they went ahead and threw that in here. So what it says here is when you change a single automation or script via the editors in the user interface, or you reload your YAML based ones, 
they all get reloaded. And that's the old way. This release changes the behavior, resolving that what the heck. Only automations that are actually changed were reloaded, all others remain running and untouched. This works both with editing an automation in the UI and reloading your YAML-based automations in any split YAML setup you might have. So it basically works all the time for both your scripts and your, um, your automations. All right, insights into water usage. Even though water usage is not uh, technically an in energy type item, uh, there has been a lot of requests, 370 votes for uh, this particular uh, this particular insight into using water. It release this release adds the ability to monitor your water usage in the energy dash dashboard. And they say, like I said, not strictly energy. It's still valuable. It's tightly coupled with stuff like energy usage, gas, hot water, that kind of stuff. So you can kind of get an insight and you can correlate things that way. So I have that running now in my energy or in my energy dashboard. So you can see how much water I've used today. And it's one of those things you have to set up in your energy dashboard settings where you go in here and you add your grid consumption, your return to grid items. You come down here and you add water consumption and you choose a water source. Now there's not a lot of these available yet and you can read more about which ones are available, but the, I use the flume water sensor and that way I'm able to get this information right here. So if we look at um, which ones, let's see if I've got the documentation. Yep, flow, flume, and home wizard energy have been adjusted to support tracking water. You can create your own trackers using MQTT templates or ESP home. All of that's documented on the tracker and there's lots of other people who have built water sensors based on the magnets in the meter itself um, to be able to track pulses and all that. So this is really a neat add. And again, because uh, it had 370 votes, it was entered and it is very popular for people to be able to track that. I like it myself, having a one-stop shop, looking at my water usage in addition to all my other energy stuff. Color, temperatures, and Kelvin. This one also had a huge number of votes, 150 times. Why doesn't Home Assistant use Kelvin for temperatures? And if I look over here at my, uh, my lamp that has an RGB bulb in it, we can see down here, maybe, that my color temperature is now in Kelvin rather than being in Mirads or whatever the other thing was. And we can see what it talks about here. Um, the Home Assistant story started using uh, Philips started when they were using the Philips Hue a long time ago. Hue uses Myrad, and I probably said that wrong, for its color temperature, not Kelvin. But today, Kelvin is much more commonly used. When you buy a light bulb at the store, it's got Kelvin rating on it, not a Myrad rating or Mirad. So Home Assistant has come up with the times and added Kelvin as well. So now you can see Kelvin settings on here instead of Mirads. Myrads, Mirads, whatever, right? And if I click on this, of course, this color temperature here is in Kelvin. So I can set this to whatever color temperature in Kelvin I want to use. All right, so that's that. Uh, Long-term statistics in the entity dialog. When you click on more info now, it uses a long-term statistics for the graphs, making the dialogs load a lot faster, especially on mobile devices. So if we look at my uh, thing here, if I click on this for long-term statistics, You'll notice here you've got the min, mean, and max. This is actually based on the long-term statistics. So if you were to build a statistics card, uh, a statistic, <laughs> that's very hard to say, statistics graph, this would be the kind of information you would see on the graph. They have just now started using this particular display within the more information for entities. So that makes that number one, load faster, but number two, consistent across what you're viewing in the Home Assistant uh, environment. Okay, so there's that. They've allowed you to set the first day of the week. This is a WTH topic. Um, so if you want your day to start on Saturday or Sunday or Monday, just depending on your geography and where you live, uh, or in my case, my work week actually starts on a Saturday um, because that's the pay period time, right? So I could really change this to a Saturday, whatever you want. It allows you to correct the day to start week based on information provided by your browser. Uh, if it cannot detect it, you can now set it in your user profile. So there's that. New templating features are here. 
Uh, for those that play with templates, you can use a state attribute and states functions as a filter and is state and is state attribute functions can now be used as tests. The average function now accepts a default value. Um, lastly, the config entry ID template method has been added, which allows you to look up native IDs um, of integration, configuration, et cetera, et cetera. Some other noteworthy changes. To me, this is huge. The default dashboard theme has been adjusted to move a little closer to the new Material Design 3 guidelines, which is what Home Assistant is based around. Borders around cards are now outlined instead of having a shadow and corners are a little more rounded. Now, when we say a little more rounded, they are really rounded. Uh, these used to all be square and now everything is rounded, which if you're like me and you like things to nicely line up, the rounding can mess with your eyes a little bit. It also changed a little bit of the height uh, aspect of these cards down here. And so I'm gonna have to readjust these to set different pixel heights on those. And one other thing I noticed too, on my mobile device, which I'll demonstrate here, all of those, instead of being squarely locked together, are now rounded. And there's more, you know, it's black, but white space, right? In between all of these little things right here. So, you know, I like the rounded. It looks more modern, but it does play around a little bit with the way I had stuff set up. And I guess I'll get used to it. If that's the material design standard and that's what everyone's going to, then I will have to uh, just accept it. So there it is. There's that. Um, again, I'll get used to it. Uh, I like it in some places, but maybe not everywhere. The automations and device dashboards now have icons on each row, making them look all nice and shiny. The unit of measurement for entities providing gas can now be changed and converted from the UI. Home Assistant is now discoverable via UPnP and SSDP, meaning your instance will show up in your Windows network. That's an interesting one there. Um, Shelly Gen 2 devices that sleep, these are the battery powered ones, are now supported. Um, and there's a bunch more in here. Let's see if there's anything else specific that we want to talk about. Uh, MQTT integration now has support for update entities for those of you that are heavy into MQTT. Jellyfin is now supported by the media player integration. Uh, statistics card now supports week as a period. I guess that wasn't there before. I didn't really even notice that. Uh, what else? Fully kiosk browser now provides a service to remotely change URLs on your wall-mounted tablet. That to me is very interesting because I do that. Anytime someone walks in front of one of my cameras, I have written an automation to change the URL. And I had to do some funny stuff to define that URL. Now I can go in there and natively update the URL to switch to the camera view whenever someone walks in front of a camera. So that will make that a lot easier in my automations. So that's cool. Uh, and Unify integration now provides individual PoE control per port for the, uh, for the client and device PoE. So that is cool for those that you use Unify, which I do, and I do have PoE devices that I have to power cycle every once in a while. And then HomeKit controller integration now supports encrypted Bluetooth notifications, reducing state change latency and number of active BLE connections. Um, and this is the cool thing too. When you set up a new generic camera, you will pre be presented with a preview of the camera showing you if it works. That is really awesome. If you don't know if you have the right URL, if you don't have the right camera entity, whatever else, you can now see it as you do that. Let me see if it shows a picture here. Uh, nope, does not. But it does work and uh, I'll play with that later on uh, to see how that goes. But that's really an, a neat feature. Uh, support for unique ID was added to Vision, MinMax, and Scrape. And then we've got some new integrations. This is a big one for people. I don't use Oral-B, but apparently it was huge. It was a huge thing asked for. Now you can look at your toothbrush, your brushing time, whatever else you want to look for in your Oral-B devices. And finally, we always talk about the breaking changes at the end of this stuff. Uh, revolutions per minute. Uh, that doesn't do anything for me, but if you have RPM, you need to change that. Uh, these are the things that use that. And I'm not going to go through all of these. I don't see anything specific other than like the Brother printer. Uh, in fact, that's probably broken on my stuff now. It changes the uh, attributes of the sensors. Uh, they've been migrated to their own dedicated sensor entities instead of attributes. So you have to update anything you use for that. Uh, dark space, dark skies probably used by a bunch. 
Uh, it's configured to report in U.S. units a unit of measurement for precipitation has been corrected from inches to inches per hour. Okay. Uh, those with Ecobee, need to look at that. Um, and all of these other ones. Make sure you always look at the breaking changes. Because if you don't look at the breaking changes and you uh, update, you could potentially break something and not know about it. And remember, the repair center does tell you when you have things that are not going to work. Uh, such as MQTT entities or whatnot that will be deprecated in a certain version of Home Assistant, or if you have something in your Home Assistant instance that needs attention, it will show as um, it will show as a thing on the sidebar over here. Uh, so, like for example, I guess I should show you. Eh? Uh, it should show you. It'll show you something like this where you have issues that need to be addressed. So make sure you look at those breaking changes. Uh, that's a quick update, rundown, et cetera, of what's in Home Assistant 2022.11. Let me know if you have any questions down below. If you're not a channel subscriber, just take a second. I would really appreciate it if you hit that button. It really helps the algorithm, helps my videos get out there for people to see them if you like what I do so other people can enjoy them as well. Thanks for watching, and we will see you on the next video.